Chopin's Prelude in E minor, an iconic masterpiece that has only 25 bars and seems quite simple at first glance, but reveals many fascinating secrets and treasures if we look a bit deeper. If you wish to go beyond the notes and uh, learn how to play this prelude with that effortless expressive mastery that gives people goosebumps and makes them think that you're just very gifted, keep watching and follow along as I guide your every step in the process of understanding and practicing this music. As always, we start by taking a look at the bigger picture so that your tasks are clear and your practice is targeted. Frédéric Chopin, who was one of the greatest romantic composers, frequently called the poet of the piano, wrote the 24 Preludes Opus 28 in 1838 during his quite uncomfortable and very unhappy stay in Mallorca with Georges Sand. Why the number 24? Why did he write 24 preludes and not 20 or 25 or 30? The number 24 is not random, but a continuation of the tradition started by Johann Sebastian Bach with his well-tempered clavier. And 24 represents the number of keys or tonalities. As an homage to Bach, Chopin wrote 24 preludes, one in each key alternating major and minor. Please note that he did not write fugues as well. Instead, he took the genre of the prelude, which means an introduction, something that happens before the main part of the composition, and took it to new heights and developed it so that it became a well-rounded, standalone composition. By the way, this tradition of writing cycles of 24 preludes did not stop with Chopin. And there are many other famous cycles of preludes, such as the ones written by Debussy, Rachmaninoff or Scriabin. The prelude in E minor, which is the fourth prelude in the cycle Opus 28, is actually a great one to start your Chopin journey with. The piece is quite short. It is not very challenging from a purely technical point of view, which makes it accessible for the intermediate level. From an emotional point of view, it is quite accessible as well, even though we have layers and layers, as we will discover very shortly. And of course, from a purely expressive point of view, which is the ability to bring out this entire emotional content, then this prelude is quite advanced, but that is okay. And if, as an intermediate player, you don't bring this piece to complete expressive mastery, so to speak, during your first encounter with it, you will have a chance to return to it later on as you continue to make progress. But this first encounter will open the door for you to the amazing universe, which is Chopin's music. It will set that important foundation that you will continue to build and strengthen during your entire life. And now, before starting our practice, I will quickly walk you through the main points of the analysis process that will instantly give you a very clear understanding of what this music is about and what you need to bring out in your playing. The first thing we should probably discuss is the fact that Chopin wanted this prelude to be played at his funeral, together with Mozart's Requiem. This gives us a pretty powerful insight into the artistic concept, and the artistic concept is the first thing we need to analyze and understand. As we know, Chopin didn't like to give titles to his works. Nonetheless, many of his pieces, including some of the preludes, received titles from other musicians and editors, and it is also believed that Chopin has drafted not titles, but a series of thoughts that were used as a starting point or as an association for most of his preludes. And among these thoughts that were related to the preludes, one of them goes like this. 
Quelles larmes au fond du cloître humide? Which can be translated as What tears are shed or can be seen or can be found in the depths of the damp monastery? So instantly you are transposed in the atmosphere of this piece. Another title that is quite famous for the E minor prelude is Suffocation. It was given by Hans von Bülow. As we start listening to this music, other words, other associations that come to our mind are lamentation, grief, despair, and simply a very deep and hopeless sadness. Here, however, I would add that this prelude has an underlying Bach foundation, I would say. So Bach's influence is very obvious once we start analyzing the text a bit deeper, which we will do next. And this Bach layer gives a note of serenity, simplicity and even transcendence to this music. So it is not a romantic lamentation that should be played, you know, like this, full of suffering and extroverted emotion. Instead, it is much more introverted, has a lot of wisdom, of resignation. It's a grief you embrace, not a grief you struggle with. I would also call it a mature grief. And the music does sound a little bit like a prayer. We can also say that the prelude represents the moments before the death of a person. If we take a look at the layout, everything keeps descending implacably, one step at a time, both in the melody and in the accompaniment. So we keep going down, one little voice, death, which will only occur at the very end of the piece. We'll get there one step at a time, though. Now we're just outlining the bigger picture. So it feels as if the entire music has this gravity that pulls it towards the inevitable end, towards death. Next, let's take a look at the most important elements of the musical text, as we usually do in our analysis. The tempo is largo, which is quite slow. However, the time signature, which is a la breve, prevents us from playing the prelude too slow in a static manner. So, this largo should not be like this, you know, falling asleep in every bar. And the pulsation should not be in four, so one, two, three, four. Instead, it should be in two. One, two. And always this continuity, moving forward, impeccable phrasing, which I will show you how to create when we get to the practice process. The tonality, E minor, is often associated with darkness, with coldness, with the feeling of loneliness and desolation. Again, strengthening this artistic concept that we are building one step at a time. If we talk about the form, the prelude is a two-part miniature. Miniature means that the piece is quite short, it expresses one feeling or one circle of images, so it doesn't have a very developed dramaturgy with many characters, with conflicts between these characters, as often happens in a larger form scale, such as Sonata Allegro, or even a three-part form or a ternary form. So the form is binary. The first part has 12 bars, and the second part starts in bar 13. Now, if we talk about texture, we have a melody plus accompaniment structure, at least at first glance. 
but we have many hidden polyphonic treasures in the left hand that only become obvious when we stop playing these chords as written, but instead notice just the changes of the voices, which we will do as well in a moment. So as I already mentioned, the Bach tradition is quite strong here. The form is always reflected in the dramaturgy or the story behind the music. In simple words, we are moving from cold loneliness in the beginning of the piece to this that happens in the second part and then gradually to quiet resignation and so on and the inevitability of death and now we can finally start our practice the first half of the piece forms one sentence. It is one big musical thought that has to be played with this unstoppable continuity. This long 12-bar sentence can be conventionally divided into three four-bar phrases. Why conventionally? Because this thought should not stop every four bars. So we will keep moving forward but at the same time, for purely theoretical purposes, it helps us to understand these smaller structures as well, also use them in the practice process, and they can also be helpful in the process of memorizing the music so we know where we're at at each point. As always, we start practicing hands separately. When it comes to the left hand, the number one secret I want to share with you today is double escapement. For those of you who don't know what that is, double escapement is this very clever mechanism that allows us to play a note and create a sound before the key has been fully raised and before the hammer has returned to its initial position. There is a way to hear the double escapement mechanism in action if you do the following experiment, and this is much easier on a grand piano as compared to an upright piano, but I'll still do my best. So, press a note, and then you have to basically try to hear a good legato between repetitions of this note of the same pitch without using the pedal, and that's when that double escapement mechanism is engaged. So, let me try here. There it is. Can you hear it? I'm creating legato between these many repetitions of the same note. Now, on an upright piano, this requires a lot of finesse in your key attack, and we will not have to apply that degree of nuance to our left hand here, but we will use the general principle. Why? Because the left hand has to be played very softly, very delicately and very continuously. We don't need, you know, just these boring repetitions, these static pillars, but this continuity that is usually created by the violin section in an orchestra. And by making clever use of this double escapement mechanism, which is actually much easier if the sustain pedal is also pressed, can create this amazing continuity where every note sounds well, but there are no strikes, no accents, and the phrasing is super smooth. So, the way we do it, as always, first make sure you're sitting comfortably, that you have a good distance between your torso and the keyboard, because otherwise, if you sit too close, you'll not have enough room here. You see how the left hand plays 
basically in the middle of the keyboard and you should aim for wide angles everywhere. Don't cram your arm and your wrist like this. So plenty of breathing room and now pay special attention to your thumb as you play this chord and also to your hand position. I see a lot of pianists playing this left hand something like this. This is a common mistake. This creates instant tension and it will be much harder for you to control these repetitions, these very subtle repetitions and the quality of your sound, the intensity of your sound. Therefore, maintain the rounded hand dome and just place a bit more of your focus in your thumb. If the thumb feels comfortable, the rest will go easier as well. Make sure the thumb is not curled too much, doesn't lay flat, but sits at this nice oblique angle. Next, when you play these chords, as I already explained, don't lift the keys all the way up. But after you have played the first one, you see, continue to play in the middle of this distance between the key surface and the key bed. In this process, the hearing is your guide. Aim for this continuity and softness. And this is the main technical principle. And as you do that, monitor that you do not tense up. A very common mistake is to tense up when we're trying to play softly because, of course, we want to avoid playing too loudly. But if we hold back in our attempt to play softly, this leads to tension and an even poorer control of sound intensity. The secret is to make relaxation, or I would say a loose, tension-free sensation. Make this your priority. Note accuracy and flawless repetition come next. So, as you practice the left hand separately, Monitor lack of tension, comfort, and so on. Now, this was the technical foundation that will be used throughout the entire piece. Sometimes we'll make crescendos, diminuendos, play with this phrasing microdynamics, as I like to call them, but the main idea remains the same. And now, before practicing each and every bar in this manner, I recommend that you do this very useful exercise, especially if your reading skills are very good, to help us understand the underlying polyphonic foundation. So we only play the notes that are changing and we will see how masterfully Chopin has built this very gradual chromatic descent from B in the right hand to E, and in the left hand as well, we start here and gradually in bar 23, we reach this position. And it would seem that this is a short distance, but we walk it excruciatingly slow, one little chromatic step at a time. So let's play like this together. Play the first chord. In the second bar, two notes change. Keep holding down this E. What an amazing polyphony. What fantastic compositional technique Chopin has here. Please notice the movement of each voice as it happens. F sharp. Lower voice moves into D sharp, then into D flat. This also really helps you to not just read these notes mechanically, which I always advise you against, but to understand what happens here from a harmonic point of view. So we were in bar eight, B, Of the first half of the piece and again the second attempt the second big wave starts in the same spot but then the chords move quicker the changes happen 
without so much preparation, the descent is more dramatic. And then suddenly we jump here. And basically the only bass note, serious bass note we have in the entire piece, then we have a full change here. Another little bass note here. And then we continue the same idea. This nice interrupted cadence, also called a deceptive cadence. And we have arrived here at the end. And already here we have this final cadence. The next step is to learn the actual chords as they are written, but without the repetitions. Don't allow the trees to distract you from seeing the forest. So let's simply see what chords we have here. Get acquainted with them. Make sure they feel comfortable. You can use even the basic rhythm, but only play the changes. And you can even do this one phrase at a time. So we just played four bars, play that again, and then move on. And here we have basically the first chord that has a little hint of warmth. is the root position of a D major seventh chord, the dominant seventh chord. But this light, which lasts for an entire bar, is very fleeting. And then in bar 8, again, a minor note is brought by this F natural. And we move forward. Notice how the changes happen here. Make sure you understand everything that you don't play this mechanically, that you don't just rely on reading. The better you assimilate this music on a deeper level, the more effortless your performance will be and the more expressive it will be as well, because it will become a part of you. And as you play it, the audience will feel that this is your message as well, not just Chopin's message. So ultimately, your hearing is your main guide, not the score. And the second part, here the changes of the chords are more interesting, more dramatic. Make sure you understand what happens here. So, after this chord, we move straight into this incomplete F major dominant 7 chord, incomplete in the left hand because this C in the right hand will complete it. Then A flat appears here. So, spend some time here. And even now, as you're simply deciphering the text of the left hand, you can work a little bit on this transition here, and then on this transition here. Don't be afraid of a more powerful sound. Use the entire arm in the playing process here. So basically use the magnifying glass method to polish each connection that feels uncomfortable to you. And if you have small hands, this chord can be quite challenging to grasp, so to speak. So make sure your hand is not just stuck in this one position like this, but even as you play the chord, there's a little bit of movement going on, you see? This will release any tension that accumulates due to the excessive stretch. This is quite easy here. Again, don't play it mechanically, understand what happens. And this is probably one of my favorite spots in the entire piece. Obviously, the whole piece is amazing, but here, have 
this interrupted cadence, this beautiful C major that appears instead of the E minor because a perfect cadence will be this is what is expected so to speak but Chopin uses the beautiful sixth step the interrupted cadence here this is basically the last breath of air of fresh air before the final exhale that will happen in the last two bars and even though this is C major the beautiful bright tonality Chopin manages to make it sound quite tragic as well which is a compositional trick so to speak that not many composers have mastered and after this we continue to learn the chords this is the last one. In the end, we have these structures. Octave, three note chord, and this E octave. Now feel free to pause the video at any step. Remember, this is a follow along practice guide. And learn these chords of the left hand at your own pace. Make sure each and every position feels comfortable that you're playing by using the entire arm, not just the fingers or the movements of your wrist or forearm. Freedom and comfort in every movement. When this is learned, the next step is to use the pedal straight away. This is important. Again, unlike in other pieces where we add the pedal at the end, here we will use it at an earlier stage as a facilitator to activate this double escapement mechanism to make this more comfortable and to polish that final effect of these smooth, flawless repetitions that are so important here. So press the pedal. We will be using the delayed pedaling technique, changing it on each new harmony, but changing it not mechanically, doing it under the guidance of your hearing. And find that sweet spot, so to speak, where you can repeat the notes softly without raising the keys all the way up. And take it quite slowly, you don't have to play this too fast. And here you see change the pedal, change the pedal, change, 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 change. Sometimes, let's say in the left hand we have eight repetitions of the same chord, we might still change the pedal depending on what happens in the right hand, but that will be more obvious when we practice both hands together. So now you can do this entire process until the end of the piece, practicing everything with pedal and making sure that the repetitions feel comfortable. As you reach the culmination, you can add a bit more oomph to the sound intensity, play a little bit deeper. Let's play from bar 13 now. So we start softly. We still use this idea of incomplete key release. Pardon me, I, it's hard to speak and follow the music without any mistakes. So it's the same idea, but we gradually start channeling more weight. Bar 15 now. Crescendo forte. Gradual diminuendo. Now I'm only highlighting the main dynamics. We're not diving into microdynamics yet. And from here we have smortando, which means dying away. And smortando, let me finish, finish the musical thought. Smortando is an expressive indication that refers both to tempo and intensity. 
we make gradual ritardando, slowing down the tempo and diminuendo, decreasing the sound intensity. And now it's time to practice the right hand. It starts with this wide opening octave intonation from B to B. But after that, we have this repeated pattern of a minor descending second. Once, the second time, and the third time. Then the melody goes a little bit lower, one step lower. So if until now B was the center note towards which C was moving, now the center note becomes A, and we have B flat A, and then three times we'll have B natural A. Second time, and the third time we have this dotted rhythm to diversify things just a little bit. So as you can see in the first two phrases, not much is happening in the melody. And our role as performers is to make this sound interesting still and to discover what expressive potential has Chopin encoded in this simplest intonation, simplest interval of a minor second. The continuation of this lesson can be found in the members area of pianocareeracademy.com along with many hundreds of other detailed tutorials for all levels, including step-by-step -step courses and interactive projects. You can become a member of PCA by clicking on the first link in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that today's lesson will help you to bring this prelude to a whole new level of mastery in case this is not a new piece for you or if this is your first encounter with this music or with Chopin's works in general, I hope that this will offer you a good foundation, a good launch pad that will help you to open the door to this magical universe that is the music of Frédéric Chopin. And by the way, what was the biggest takeaway for you after watching this tutorial? What is the main thing that you have learned and you didn't know before? Please let me know by leaving a comment below. And also, if you don't want to miss my next free tutorials, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell. Thank you again so, so much for watching. Love you guys very much. And I will see you in the next one. Until then, enjoy your practice. Bye-bye.